been an IoT seminar of 2022. Uh, this is a seminar series that we started last year uh, and we're resuming this year for lots of interesting talks uh, from academia, industry, and government. And today we have the pleasure of we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Professor Salim Kanir, who is uh, a professor at the UNSW in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, so I worked with Salil a lot over the past years, and uh, uh, I know his group does uh, great work. Uh, so Salil got his PhD from Drexel University in the US. Uh, his research interests include Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, blockchain, pervasive computing, cybersecurity, and applied machine learning. Um, Salil is also affiliated with uh, Cyrus Data 61, and I think the work he's presenting today is a collaborative work with them. Uh, he's a senior member of IEEE and ACM, and an ACM distinguished speaker and IEEE Computer Society distinguished visitor. Uh, he received many awards. Uh, including the Frederick William Besser Research Award and uh, the Humboldt Research Award. Uh, and he's also the editor in chief of Ad Hoc Networks and he's on the editorial board of uh, several other journals as well. So with that, I'd like to welcome Salil and, and pass over to you. Thank you, Raja, for the kind introduction and thanks for having me. Um, Thanks, Sean, for all the arrangements. It would have been nice to visit you folks up there, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a getting really busy down here. Yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, this work, uh, as uh, Raja mentioned, um, it's of course uh, done in collaboration with a lot of people. Uh, the talk is sort of going to focus on um, this whole notion of decentralized identity how we manage it, how we share credentials and some of the underlying issues around that. Uh, of course, uh, the lead uh, author and the person who actually uh, did most of the work is our final year PhD student, uh, Rema Mukta. So if you like what you hear, uh, I think she'll be graduating at some point this year. So certainly reach out. Um, she might be looking for some interesting opportunities. And of course, uh, my colleagues, uh, Helen, um, here at UNSW, our thesis student who worked on this project, James, and uh, our collaborator, Chinghua. So of course, uh, if you like some of the stuff here, certainly congratulate all of them. If I make any, all the errors I make are on me, okay, uh, in presenting, then if I, if I say something wrong, it's uh, me to blame. So some of the things we we'll look at are identity management, um, this whole notion. So I'll start off with some just basic introduction. Um, I mean, most of us will be aware of this given that we do a lot of things online, but it's always nice to sort of revisit this. I'll talk briefly about uh, the whole notion of decentralization of identities and how that's picking up. And then uh, I'll uh, present two pieces of work, uh, one in a bit more detail, which is uh, this whole notion of uh, preserving certain uh, uh, what we call uh, data minimization, essentially uh, preventing what's referred to as oversharing. And I'll also very briefly present some stuff that's right ho hot off the press. Uh, this last piece of work is currently under review. So uh, I'll just present some of the high level ideas there and then I'll conclude. So uh, I'm pretty sure most of you have seen the picture there on the left, if you've done some sort of security course or perhaps um, internet computer networks course. I, I, in fact, I often show this in my lectures as well. So this was a cartoon um, drawn by Peter Steiner in the New Yorker. And the point he's making there is uh, as at least uh, in the 1990s when the internet was just coming up and uh, average Joe and Jen were starting to use it. The notion was that, okay, nobody knows who you really are on the internet, right? Because you can really be anyone you want. And then uh, if you look at how uh, things have mapped out, um, this is certainly not the case anymore. Uh, there's a, if someone really wants to, they can find a lot about you, right? And I'm sure we've seen, maybe not directly happening to us, but uh, we have heard of stories like this. 
happening to other people around us, right? So this uh, sort of revisited version of this cartoon is sort of saying, um, how did they find out that I'm a dog? And perhaps they even know what this dog eats and so on and so forth. Um, in most cases, um, it's perhaps, we are sort of somewhere in the middle, I guess. Um, so we perhaps do not have this whole complete anonymity anymore, but at the same time, it's not like we are being con continuously tracked right, all the time. So it's some, we are sitting somewhere in the middle and a lot of this is uh, based, essentially stems from issues around trust, right? So we as users, we are very, these days in particular, we are very careful about um, knowing who's handling our data, um, essentially what are they doing with our data, particularly all these service providers that are collecting this, what do they know about us and so on and so forth. And then if you take the perspective of the service provider, um, I mean, they need to also be careful, right? I mean, in the end, they're providing you with services. So they want to make sure that they are actually providing the services to the right person. And uh, essentially, the, so their services are not being used for uh, nefarious purposes, say, for example, like money laundering uh, and so on and so forth, right? So they invest a lot of uh, effort and money into this whole know your customer process if you think about it. Um, so yeah, so essentially there's a bit of a lack of trust um, on both sides and uh, the costs of this are quite enormous. I mean, these are just some uh, bullet points um, sort of highlighting these issues, but uh, I think uh, I just checked actually this morning. Uh, I use uh, like perhaps many of you use a password manager. So I think I've got like 200 plus uh, passwords in there. So this number is not far off that's shown here. Um, so clearly this is, I mean, it's enormous. This burden is enormous of managing all these accounts and passwords. And then uh, if something does get stolen, if your identity uh, or part of it gets stolen, then there are of course uh, economic repercussions. Uh, people lose money, particularly if it's things like your bank account, credit cards and stuff like that. And a lot of us do not use proper password hygiene. So some of us reuse passwords and stuff like that. So that also creates all sorts of problems, right? Uh, and so there's this uh, bullet points here about how um, a lot of, I mean, almost the majority of American consumers believe that they've uh, lost complete control of their personal information, right? And then the problem with having these siloed entities is of course, uh, if they get hacked, then it's not just one person, it's like millions, billions of account information that gets uh, revealed. So of course, uh, there's been a lot of thought to this and how we address this problem. So there's this whole notion of um, managing identities, right, um, in, a, in the digital world. And that is kind of rather essential uh, as we keep moving forward. Um, and uh, depend more on the digital economy. And now one thing to point out in most of this discussion, I'll kind of refer to people, right? So the examples I'll give are real sort of real people, but of course this also translates to devices. Uh, and in fact, that's happening a lot more today uh, with the emergence of the internet of things. And uh, we are seeing concrete examples where devices are just communicating with each other, this whole notion of device to device or machine to machine communication. So uh, identifying those devices and making sure they're the right kind of devices and they're sending the right kind of messages is now even more important. So these notions really extend to just uh, anything. I mean, not just people, but any devices. So just taking a step back and looking at uh, what models are out there, right? So this left model here is what we are all very well versed with. So this is essentially a centralized model. Uh, it's completely siloed in that each, uh, you create an account with each of these service providers. Uh, the service providers sort of maintain a central repository of those accounts. And then we as users have to manage the uh, account credentials ourselves. And of course you create such multiple accounts. Uh, so this is something we're well familiar with. Uh, this second notion here shown at the top 
is uh, the federated model or essentially the single sign-on process. Um, if I think a lot of us here are working at universities, so we are perhaps well familiar with this, particularly here at UNSW, uh, we have this signal sign-on that allows us to sign into all the university services, right? And essentially that's, we have just offloaded that to Microsoft to manage, right? So that's your ID provider. And then we use this single credential to log into the various services. Um, now, of course, uh, this is better than this, but again, this is kind of still siloed in that you can only access services within that particular context, right? So within the university context, there's no sort of global ID provider like that, where you just use one sign on for everything. Right? That wouldn't just work. And then uh, something kind of a little similar to this, uh, that's also emerging is uh, all this uh, OAuth uh, kind of stuff where you log into other providers using your social media account information, right? So that can be convenient, but then you're paying the price, right? Because if you start using Facebook to log into all these services, then Facebook knows what kind of services you're using. And then, um, yeah, so you're kind of revealing uh, some information to them. So these are all uh, service centric, essentially, as I was shown on the previous slide. Uh, what we are used to really is uh, what we want really, or what we see in the physical world is this user centric approach, right? Or me centric. So we all have our physical wallets. We have our credit cards in there, our driver's license, our passports. Essentially, this gives us a lot more control, right? And so this is something we are kind of familiar with. So the question now remains, can we sort of mimic this in some form in the digital landscape? And that's where this whole notion of decentralization of identities comes into play, right? So there's uh, this whole idea of self-sovereign identities or SSI, which, is, uh, which has sort of come up with some basic principles around that. Uh, and the idea here is we do not have a single sort of trusted third party we essentially uh, rely on some uh, decentralized register that uh, verifies uh, our identity, right? So this allows uh, each individual, each uh, entity essentially to directly establish um, relationships, P2P relationships with each other by leveraging on this uh, decentralized register. Um, of course, we do need uh, some sort of security mechanisms. Um, so essentially public private key crypto to uh, communicate with that platform. Uh, but then um, it, the entities can freely establish peer-to-peer um, -peer trust with each other. Now, the, even though the picture shows uh, this represented as a blockchain, it doesn't have to be, but uh, blockchain is emerging as a good contender for managing this um, backend essentially. So the idea there being that uh, we essentially have a similar wallet um, in the digital space, uh, and then we get credentials uh, which are issued to us by these various organizations, right? be it government organizations, be it other services, be it social media accounts. And then it is, uh, we are managing those identities uh, through those uh, digital wallets. And then we have greater control on those identities. So uh, it's then up to us how we reveal that uh, to other individuals. Right? So again, there's uh, various principles around this. Uh, I won't go into all the nitty gritty details. Uh, and mind you, SSI, just uh, that whole notion is just presenting certain desired guidelines. They are not actually presenting a full implementation or anything like that. Right? So there are various ways you could sort of build an SSI system. So one particular problem we noticed and which uh, we are addressing in this first piece of work is the oversharing problem, right? So a classic example we always give is if you go to a pub, you're expected to show your driver's license to verify your age. Um, okay. Now think about it that... Yeah. No, it's going to update things. <laughs> yeah. well, this is all. I think someone's not muted, so... Okay. Yeah, so um, 
yeah the person the security person whom you show your driver license driver's license to doesn't really need to know your address um, probably they don't even need to know your name um, they just need to check whether you're over 18 right so strictly speaking they don't even need to know your date of birth as such um, and again similar examples are shown here which are perhaps a bit more relevant now with the um, vaccine certificates so these are showing you sort of snapshots of how the certificate looks like in a real digital wallet and you see again here there's some additional information that perhaps um, doesn't need to be there right like my date of birth for example uh, and so on and so forth so this is what we refer to as a lack of data minimization right so we essentially want mechanisms in the digital world where when we are sharing a certain credential information we should be able to restrict uh, what can be shown and only show things that are required for that particular purpose for which we are sharing this credential so this is the uh, main uh, work a main problem that we tackle in this piece of work so this was a paper we published in trustcom uh, luckily it got selected as the best paper for that conference and we also got a lot of uh, press on this so this is just showing you one particular story so it's called cred chain um, and uh, here we'll focus on that particular issue of data minimization using this notion of selective disclosure so what we do in this work is we are proposing this architecture called a cred chain um, and essentially it's uh, leveraging it's uh, of course following the ssi guidelines it's leveraging a blockchain essentially as the underlying platform for managing the identity information so as you all know blockchains are essentially decentralized and immutable and they allow us to establish trust even if uh, the participants are not necessarily trusting of each other right uh, so any data that's stored there so things like the credentials um, are essentially tamper proof and it's fairly straightforward to vary uh, this uh, fairly quickly so what we do is uh, we allow in, in our architecture we allow a user to request a credential from say some registered issuer uh, via a, a d app and store this credential in his or her private wallet right and when the credential is shared by this particular uh, user they can redact certain parts of the credential um, so going back to that example they could redact say the date of birth that you saw on that vaccine passport right sorry vaccine certificate um, so and they can do this while still maintaining the validity right so the point here being okay you can redact stuff but you still want to be able to verify that what is being revealed is actually valid so that's what this system allows us to do uh, what we also do is allow a certain time constraint so you can set a duration of time for which uh, you can limit the verifiers access so they don't have essentially unlimited access to your credential right and the key point here is uh, we do this in a way where we do not need to keep regenerating the redacted credentials um, i mean uh, without having to reissue them right so we are not going back to the issuer each time to say hey give us a new credential with this combination of us credentials and so on and so forth so we get the credential uh, once and then locally we can sort of hide things uh, uh, at the user level itself right <clears throat> so this is all done um, using a full architecture so we propose the whole architecture where we store the credentials share them on the user wallet uh, the d app so it's essentially this whole thing um, that we've proposed in this piece of work, uh, in this piece of work which i'll go over so just a few terminologies that are sort of relevant here so the issuer is the entity that is sort of uh, giving out the credential so you could imagine these to be like official entities like say a university a government organization so we use uh, in our paper we've used this uh, transcript essentially as an example right so here you see the university is issuing a transcript uh, jane in this case is the recipient uh, whose transcript this is and then jane when she reveals this to uh, say to different users she may want to reveal different parts of this right so she may not want to reveal the entire 
credential, but she may want to hide certain things depending on who is the uh, person she's trying to uh, send this information to. So the this person here is referred to as the verifier. So that's the one that's going to receive this and then verify with the uh, system that uh, whatever is being shown is indeed valid, right? Um, so this is what we mean by uh, selective disclosure, essentially. Right? Uh, now the individual fields here are referred to as credential attributes. Uh, this whatever is generated here is referred to as a claim. So that's an assertion being made uh, about the recipient, and that's essentially a subset of those attributes from a credential. Right? Okay. So how do we do this? Uh, so the underlying sort of uh, method we use is uh, what's referred to as uh, redactable signature generation. So there are uh, several uh, signature schemes which are use, I mean, which can do selective disclosure, uh, but they either require the issuer to sign a new claim uh, each time the recipient uh, wishes to disclose a different subset of those attributes, or they may need a third trusted third party, right? So uh, that's not what we want. Um, so using this particular piece of work by Johnson, uh, we, we can create a redactable signature credential um, essentially once, and uh, multiple claims can be generated uh, without requiring the original issuer to resign or any third party interaction. Right? <clears throat> and this can also prevent the issuer from correlating the recipient's uh, credential sharing activities. So the base uh, technology that this based on is uh, what's referred to as uh, the GGM, uh, Goldrick Goldwasser Mikhali tree construction, right? So this works in three phases. So essentially you get a random seed and then uh, you sort of generate this pseudo random sequence at each node using that random seed working down the tree, uh, as you see here. Uh, once you generate that, uh, the second phase involves uh, doing the hashing where you're generating a Merkle tree uh, construction working up the tree. Um, the leaf nodes essentially are hashed together along with the random values that are generated in the phase one. Um, and then once all of this is done, the final phase is essentially you sign the uh, hashed root and you create what's referred to as this uh, extended signature, which also includes some auxiliary information such as the uh, seed, uh, the random seed in this case, right? Now note that in our case, uh, the leaf nodes here would be the attributes that we were referring to in the previous slide. So we actually allow flexibility for uh, two entities within that broader system. So we allow flexibility for the uh, recipient who's receiving this credential to be able to redact uh, whatever attributes they wish to do. Right. So this is outlining essentially the step-by-step -step process. So the first step is essentially setting up some basic parameters, setting up uh, the public private keys for all the entities. Uh, the second step is where the issuer who's giving out the credential is uh, following that particular uh, method I showed you on the previous slide to generate uh, the uh, credential uh, as you see here, uh, along with the uh, signature that I showed you earlier. And this is then passed on to the um, user. And this is also, uh, by the way, stored in the blockchain, right? Uh, so this allows for verification later. Uh, step three is what the user does, the recipient. So they take this, um, they take the original credential, they take the original signature, and then this RM essentially refers to the attributes that they want to redact. Right. So perhaps say they're redacting the date of birth. So that would be one of those attributes. So what they do here is they redact the attributes to generate uh, the C prime, uh, which is what uh, is the claim that they will send out. Um, and at, while doing so, the hashes of those attributes and the particular indexes are uh, removed from that whole tree because we don't want to include them. Uh, the actual attributes are removed, sorry. And then the hashes of those attributes and the indexes are included in the auxiliary information that's uh, sent in this extensible uh, signature. And then this is the claim that's sent to the verifier. So the verifier can then take this. Uh, they have the they compute the hashes of all the revealed attributes 
uh, they take the hashes that are in that extensible signature they can then check the entire computed signature against uh, that that was generated here which they can source uh, from the uh, blockchain and then they can verify that uh, this is indeed correct right <clears throat> Uh, what we also provide is flexibility for the issuer so you could imagine a scenario where when the issuer is giving out a credential they may say okay these fields are some things that are non-negotiable they have to be there on the credential right so they're essentially preventing you from hiding certain um, attributes right so that can also be done um, and the process is not very different so yeah you go through the setup uh, in this case here this rdt is the set of attributes that are uh, mandatory essentially uh, so these uh, sorry these are the attributes uh, yeah yeah these are the attributes that are mandatory so they must always be there um, and then um, the issuer uh, sorry the recipient can then redact certain other attributes if these don't match then the system will complain essentially it will not allow you to remove attributes that you cannot and then the rest of the process is uh, fairly similar right so that's the main um, concept there that's used now this is the broader architecture uh, so here we have two parts essentially we have the ssi part and then we have uh, the d app so the d app allows users to interact uh, with the blockchain uh, this is all implemented in a client app uh, you'll notice each user there has uh, each issuer sorry each uh, issuer has a database here uh, which contains certain um, identity and fact data for the recipient's identity and then all the verifiable credentials are stored say in a cloud server there uh, the ssi so you'll notice there are certain things uh, that are on the chain here uh, and then there are there's a certain services that are implemented so these are kind of fairly self-explanatory and they kind of form part of the ssi architecture really so things like the account services for managing the blockchain accounts the did services for managing dids did by the way stands for a decentralized identifier id uh, the issuer services for managing issuer el eligibility to sign credentials and this is the part that we've added on so this is the uh, these are what we call the credential services so here you'll notice uh, certain functions that are relevant to the selective disclosure process that I mentioned in the previous slide. So the setup, the signature, and the redaction functions, and then a separate verification process for uh, others to verify those claims. And then the on-chain data is all implemented using smart contracts. So this is the DID re registry, the issuer registry, and the credential registry, right? And uh, a note that this is fairly extensible in that um, you could, if you came up with a different way to do selective disclosures, all you really need to do is plug in your approach here, right? Uh, the rest of the uh, system can remain as is. So it's fairly modular and extensible. Uh, so in terms of the steps involved, uh, I'm not showing you the initial registration process, but uh, the users have to first register with the system. Uh, the next thing uh, they want to do uh, before sort of um, exchanging, sort of setting up that P2P relationship is uh, the participants need to identify themselves to each other uh, using identities with the credentials that are registered on the blockchain, right? And all of this communication happens via the DApp server. So here you'll notice the recipient is sending an access request to the uh, DApp server along with their DID and um, information that may be relevant to the issuer. Uh, the DApp server collects this, um, yeah, the issuer identification details, and then forwards the access request to the issuer. The issuer would then verify um, the, uh, all that information and then send back uh, the uh, requested information uh, there. Uh, so this is where the credential is actually issued. So the recipient sends a request for a credential to the server. Again, it gets the recipient's details, forwards the request. Um, here is, uh, this is where the issuer can then call the, uh, uh, creates the credential and sends it. And now the issuer can actually hide stuff, right? Uh, 
essentially selectively disclose stuff. So this uh, invoke the signature process is essentially done here. Um, and then the issuer uploads the uh, credential to the private uh, clouds and generates a shareable link. And then this can be sent to the receiver uh, via our DApp server and um, via the DApp server and you notify the recipient, right? The recipient may then uh, view the credential or download it to their device and so on and so forth. Uh, this step is for the actual verification. Um, so here the recipient is redacting certain information. Um, so perhaps hiding their date of birth and stuff like that. Uh, they generate the claim. Um, this claim is essentially uh, stored on the recipient's private cloud and then a shareable link is generated for the verifier. So this is all done using um, JSON web tokens, I believe, right? Uh, and then the verifier will take this uh, web token, uh, call that verification module um, in the platform. Uh, this will decode that check whether the access period is valid. It will call the verify function here and then make sure uh, everything is okay, right? So that's sort of the whole uh, big picture of this process. Uh, now, in terms of uh, other works, certainly there at that time there was a few other works out there. So we compare um, against some of these. So things like uh, Sovereign, Block Search, these are all sort of well-known platforms out there. So we were looking at essentially whether they can do selective disclosure and whether they can also allow time constrained access, right? So essentially just limiting access to a certain time period. And we found that none of these actually meet both these requirements. Um, and that is uh, where our architecture sort of plugs the hole. In terms of implementation, uh, we did uh, build this whole system, uh, I guess uh, James and Rema did to be more precise. So all of this was done using, uh, the D app was done using Node.js and JSON. Uh, the user devices just access the HTTP URLs. So there was nothing special to do there. Uh, the D app doesn't actually store anything locally. All the interaction between the D app and uh, the D app server and the blockchain is through uh, web three JS APIs. And uh, the smart contracts in the blockchain were of course all uh, written in solidity. Uh, the um, parity blockchain node essentially was used. Uh, the client of app was developed uh, for both iOS and Android. And in terms of managing the credentials here um, as the cloud server, we just used uh, Google Drive uh, as a proxy, right? The DApp server was run on a Linux machine. Uh, the interblock time was set to five seconds. And the client requests were sort of, because we wanted to test this system with a high load, we couldn't do that using actual devices. So we generated those client requests uh, via JMeter on a local virtual machine. So these are just some snapshots of some of the performance results. So if you go back to the earlier discussion, the key uh, sort of, what we perceive as time consuming part of this whole process is going to be that whole signature generation process, right? So this, uh, we were sort of benchmarking two things, the credential issuance, which requires us to uh, generate this key and then the claim verification, right? So if you look at the credential issuance, building the tree structure, uh, so that's what takes most of the time. The actual sharing of the link is fairly standard, right? So that's just a, a static process for our implementation, it took about two seconds. So here we are plotting the time to do the verification, uh, the, sorry, the signature generation as a function of how many attributes you might have in the credential. And as you would expect, the more attributes, the longer it takes. Uh, that said, even if you had over 100 at 128 attributes, the actual time to do this is like um, eight milliseconds, right? So that's hardly substantial. Uh, then the verification process involves downloading the credential from the private store. You reconstruct the tree, um, which is kind of similar. And then you verify the identity by doing a lookup on the issuer registry. So some of these processes are static. Um, and generally we found that the ex execution time of this whole workflow was um, less than 1.5 seconds. So that's again, fairly reasonable. 
Now this here is showing you uh, the how much load our system could handle, right? So for here we were sending, I think, a total of 10,000 requests, I believe. Uh, and we found that the average throughput, which was kind of stabilizing, was around 103 transactions per second. So this is essentially the uh, uh, throughput of the blockchain, uh, which again is fairly high. And mind you, these numbers are specific to our platform. If you used higher performance machines, uh, you would probably get higher um, numbers there. Okay, so that concludes that um, first piece of work. Um, I may move on to this more recent work that we did. Uh, so this is uh, looking at a different problem. So here we are focusing on who can sort of serve as the, I mean, essentially, uh, if you look at current SSI platforms or even the previous work, uh, the credentials can only be issued by what are called official entities, right? So these are sort of government agencies or universities and so on and so forth. And all of these entities have gone through a stringent process to verify that they can actually issue credentials, right? So this is all done offline. This is not something you can do instantly online, right? Um, but there is no way to allow regular users essentially to uh, create, um, to, uh, to extend the same level of trust, right? So we can't sort of issue credentials as a regular user. I mean, you could, but then there is no way the uh, burden on verification is then entirely up to the receiver, right? So we need a way whereby uh, any uh, user can issue credentials. And then the person who wants to verify that can actually verify and confirm that this uh, is indeed a valid credential. So then they can offer that person the service that they're requesting. So example that we use is um, in the context of healthcare, right? So let's say uh, I've had a fall here, I get admitted to the hospital and uh, there's someone here, say uh, one of my colleagues who's taken me to the hospital. And I want to quickly to be able to um, give them a letter of authority as such to uh, action the uh, decision-making for whatever health uh, procedural decisions that need to be made about my treatment, right? To this person, because I might lose consciousness or whatever, right? So there should be a way, essentially, uh, we are kind of trying to mimic the situation that you might have in the physical world where you could write up a uh, letter of authority, sign it, and then someone who can, who receives this letter of authority, say my colleague takes it to another person and says, hey, I've got the letter of authority to take this decision. And then that particular person can actually verify that all of this uh, is indeed valid. So that's what we want to be able to mimic, uh, except in the context of uh, decentralized identities. And now, at least to our knowledge, uh, this uh, does not exist a proper way to do this as of yet. Right? So that's where this cred test um, architecture came about. So what we are doing is uh, allowing uh, issuer onboarding. Um, and here we are not relying on, cent I mean, you can do this using centralized uh, authorities like CAs and stuff, but we don't want to do that. So what we found was there are parallels to this uh, in the general um, context of the internet, right? So we've all heard of the web of trust, uh, this idea of signing each other's keys and not relying on a certificate authority for signing keys. So similarly, similar to this notion of web of trust, we want to essentially uh, allow the creating of a credential chain as we call it, right? So cred trust is proposing that whole system, of course, uh, a system whereby you can propagate this trust and verify this trust. Uh, and then all of this is again, based on the notion of SSI uh, using a distributed public, um, uh, dis distributed uh, infrastructure using a blockchain essentially. And we do actually uh, build a proof of concept of this in Hyperledger and demonstrate that uh, the overheads are minimal. So very quickly, uh, what I mean by a trust path here is, is uh, what's shown on this picture. So what we create is this notion of a supporting credential. So this is a verifi verifiable credential for forming a trust path, right? So we envisage three <coughs> levels in this case, so we have the official issuers, which are still the standard sort of top level issuers um, who are officiated by the 
uh, governance authority. So in this particular healthcare example, this could be say the hospitals, uh, as you see here, right? And they have issued these supporting credentials to these various doctors, as you see here, right? <clears throat> Below that, we have what we call the proxy issuers. So these are endorsed by the official issuers, uh, but they in turn can also issue regular credentials. So this could be things like uh, prescriptions and stuff like that, right? Um, and they can also propagate trust to the next level issuer. So that's what you see happening here, right? So this hospital, uh, th this doctor essentially is uh, propagating this credential to the patient. So they are allowing the patient to create what's called a delegation credential, right? Um, and then at the bottom here, we have the personal issuers, right? So these are endorsed by the proxy issuers and they can issue self-signed credentials such as delegation. So in this case, this patient C can then uh, create this delegation credential and pass on the delegation of this decision making to a relative, as you see here. So this is how the trust propagation works. So we are creating this uh, chain, credential chain, if you may. You'll also notice it's also possible to uh, receive endorsements from multiple users. So here you notice uh, Dr. Y has received uh, endorsements from two hospitals, right? So if there are cases where you might want uh, that to be a sort of factor where you're not just relying on uh, one, you might require an entity to have two or more uh, endorsements. So that can also be factored in. Right? So again, this is fairly extens extensible you know, in that sense. The architecture is uh, kind of shown here. So we have uh, an external governance layer. So that's uh, the accreditation authority. So this is uh, the, this entity essentially set the rules and regulations for all the participating entities, including the official users. And then here we have the internal issuer layer, right? So these are the hierarchies. Uh, so we have the official users at the top, the proxy users, personal users, and so on and so forth. Uh, this backend is kind of similar to what I showed you earlier, again, based on the SSI principles. Um, so we have the service layer, we have the data layer. The only thing really that we add here is this trust registry, if you may, right? For storing the hashes of all the supporting credentials. So this can be used to verify that credential of trust. Uh, one thing that we haven't done in this architecture is we haven't looked at revocation, right? Um, so at some point, uh, this uh, supporting credential may have to be revoked. So that's some ongoing work that we are doing that wasn't addressed. Uh, so we want a way whereby that verification can fail after a certain, uh, after the credential has been revoked. For uh, performance, again, I'm not showing you all everything from the paper, but uh, we did implement this in um, Hyperledger Fabric. Um, all of that uh, that you saw, I mean, the implementation is kind of similar. We have smart contracts for managing the registries. Uh, the block, blockchain node work is uh, executed on a high performance server and the client is just a local machine. We used Caliper for the various benchmarking process, uh, benchmarking all the uh, metrics. And uh, we choose the model with uh, two endorsing peers from uh, two communicating parties, essentially the issuer and the holder through a single communication channel and uh, one ordered peer to run the ordering services. So here uh, we show you results for two uh, parts, two, two important functions. So one is the issuer onboarding. So this involves uh, sharing a link, uh, writing a transaction to that trust registry I showed you, and then update operation in the issuer registry. I haven't shown you the entire workflow that's all in the paper, but um, I, as I suspect I'm running out of time here anyway. So all these results are averaged over 20 runs and we compare this against the baseline, which is not doing all of this essentially. Uh, so you'll notice, of course, uh, our architecture adds a little overheads, but these overheads are fairly low. So you'll see both systems kind of top off in terms of their throughput around here, right? Our tops off a little lower than the baseline. And it also introduces a little more delay, but again, that's acceptable um, in this particular context. 
And similarly, this part here shows you the performance for verification. So here, um, the what we need to do is we need to uh, read from the registry to verify the credential, and then um, read from the issuer registry to verify the issuer signature. So again, that process is not very different in both, even in the baseline and our architecture. So as expected, the performance here is kind of similar for verification. Okay, so uh, as I get to the end here, I might just highlight some interesting things that might be worth looking at, uh, that might not be, who knows. Uh, so we've all heard of the metaverse, right? Uh, that's something that seems to be happening. I myself haven't had a good handle on this, uh, but uh, so the notion there uh, was first uh, sort of put forward by Neil Stephenson, right? In um, what was his novel? Snow, snow crash, right? So the idea of creating this uh, 3D virtual world inhabited by avatars of real people. Um, and this is certainly picking up as we all know, uh, Meta and there are other companies trying to get into this uh, where we create this digital representation. Um, it can either mirror something conventional or it can be just completely fictional, right? And we are kind of getting there. I mean, if you look at what's happening with gaming, a lot of interesting things are actually happening with gaming in the past uh, recent years, right? So there's this whole notion of uh, play to earn, right? The idea that you can actually earn uh, cryptocurrency by just participating in games and whereby if you win certain uh, battles in the game environment, uh, you can sort of be given certain NFTs and you could actually trade those NFTs on a open market, right? So this is really happening. Uh, and so the, how does this relate to identity? Well, if you think about it, uh, even in the metaverse, you're going to be faced with those same problems, right? How do you sort of identify yourself? How do you authenticate the right kind of people to have the experience that you want them to, right? So I think there are some interesting things happening there, something to look at from the perspective of uh, identity management. Can we draw some lessons from what we do today? Can we look at this whole notion of um, using NFTs as a way to identify people? And then how do we port them across different ecosystems? What does it mean? I mean, it does SSI even apply in the metaverse? Uh, and things like that. So the I'm, I'm not sort of giving any answers here. I'm just raising some questions that might come up as we move forward with this. So to conclude, uh, this work has been sort of or uh, looking at this whole notion of decentralization of identity management, which is kind of important these days. I talked about uh, this cred chain uh, idea where we focus on data minimization, um, only revealing certain attributes and not revealing the entire credential. And then I briefly touched upon this whole notion of creating a credential chain, right? No, using the concepts of web of trust uh, to onboard uh, individual users so that they can actually issue trustworthy credentials. So uh, I think I'm just about on time here. So thanks uh, again for the opportunity, Raja. I'm happy to take comments and questions. Thanks so much, Salid, for that very interesting talk. It's a very timely topic, and uh, it's, it was very interesting to hear the work that you've done. So I've, yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I invite people to just maybe unmute and turn on your camera if you'd like to ask a question. Hey, Salil, this is uh, Kevin Sarek over at, uh, in Brisbane. How are you doing? I'm good, Kevin. Thanks. Uh, I'm, just, I'm doing pretty well. Just turn my camera on here. Um, <laughs> interesting talk. And uh, you can see uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, of foresight in the work, I think, because as things progressively move more and more into the digital domain, as more and more of our senses are being captured, even with something as simple as this, you know, you can imagine having augmented hearing and how do you deal with all this massive amount of data and the credentials that, you know, who do you want to listen to what you're listening to? Who do you want to allow to listen? Uh, it becomes a bit of a problem when you have these, these concepts of delegations because you may find that there's a granularity issue. 
Um, what do you, what, I was curious about your thoughts on what is the correct amount of granularity or is there some mechanism for, uh, that you have in mind for, for determining, you know, what if I give access to all the audio that I'm listening to, or what if I give access to just a single bank record? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you can imagine that become onerous for a user. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, Kevin, yeah, that's a very good point. And um, essentially sort of, you could imagine creating scopes, right? Some sort of notion of a scope, how much uh, you want to reveal. I don't know if there's a good answer because it kind of depends on the context as well, right? So, um, I mean, when it comes to financial information, we probably want it to be very tight in terms of uh, specific things. Whereas if it's something to do with social media and stuff like that, perhaps that scope could be broadened. Uh, and certainly if you ask, I mean, users are struggling with just pure identification. If you ask them to sort of create these scopes themselves, I think, yeah, it's just going to be very tricky. Um, I wonder maybe there could be some way, some sort of, uh, I'm just sort of thinking aloud, some sort of signal system, uh, green, amber, yellow, stuff like that, which can be a little easier for you users to navigate around and whereby mm -hmm. they could quickly sort of attach say, okay, if this is a critical application, you make it really thin, the scope thin, or you could sort of say, okay, broaden the scope, something like that. Right? I don't know if that's a good answer, but maybe that's something for some of our students to look at, right? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect you to have a perfect answer on that. It's more just on your musings, but you, you make an interesting point. You almost want to be able to mathematically model it. So if you were to say, okay, what's the persistence of this data or what's the frequency or what's the, you know, the absolute or relative amounts of the, and importance of this data, you could almost flag it as being, you know, a red, green, red, or yellow uh, 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 your classification. So th there's some interesting takes on that there. Thank you. Thanks. So Salil, I had a question about the, the CRED trust. Uh, I see there's many levels of delegation of trust in that approach. Um, have you considered situations where some of those middle layers might be compromised and how you deal with them? <laughs> yeah, that's still uh, something we need to look at, certainly. Um, yeah, in this work, we didn't, I mean, um, I guess one way to deal with that could be to try to not just rely on one chain, perhaps uh, make sure that there's at least multiple uh, parties endorsing the claim. So that's that's something that we see also in the whole uh, web of trust idea, right? That the more people who are sort of signing that someone else's signature, the more confidence you have. So perhaps that could be a way to look at that and see what is, how do we strike that balance? How many do we need um, so that we can, if something goes bad, or when someone goes rogue, then that's not impacting the system. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? I guess that's a no. So uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you again, Salil, for your time and the great talk. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And uh, also thanks to Sean for organizing the, uh, making all the arrangements for this talk. So thanks. Thanks, thanks again, Raja. Thanks, Sean. And thanks to everyone who attended. And we hope to see you in person soon, whether it's- Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for joining. I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.